So when the action is um, worthwhile, when we take it to be worthwhile for its own sake, um, then R tells us why we think that. What it is about that action that makes it worth doing for its own sake. Okay, so let me say one more time. Whenever we will, we will an end that we think worth pursuing. We will some end that we take to be good. The maxim is going to specify the principle of our action. And we better be able to find in that maxim what it is that we're going for. Sometimes what it is that we're going for will be R. Sometimes R will simply tell us why that action is valuable, why we take that action to be valuable. Okay, so for example, I'll charge everyone the same price because that will help my reputation. So I'm going to suppress the circuit to the C. I'm going to suppress the circuit. So I'm charging everyone the same price. That's A. And I'm doing that because that will help my reputation. So that's the incentive. That's the reason. That's why I think charging everyone a fair price would be a good thing. Because I think my reputation would be a good thing. And this will help that. Okay, so there's an example of a maximum. Here's another. I'll charge everyone the same price because that's what I happen to feel like doing. So here, I'm charging everyone the same price. That's my action. And R does not specify some further goal. The goal really is to charge everyone the same price. The reason why that's my goal is not because it's some further end, but because that thing itself is something I happen to like. So the incentive is the reason why I'm doing that for its own sake is because I have an inclination to. And lastly, here's another maxim. I will charge everyone the same price, same action, same action in all three of these, because that's what's fair. So my recognition, in this case, my recognition that that action is fair is what makes it attractive to me. That's the incentive for me, in this case. Uh, there's not some further goal that I'm trying to accomplish by doing this. I'm doing it for its own sake, just like here. But the reason why I think it's worth doing for its own sake is different. And the difference between these two maxims reflects that. Questions about this? So I want to say, again, in all three of these maxims, A is the same. R is different. The incentive is different. Is that clear? OK, and, and of course, the point is, um, for Kant, that um, our assessment, our intuitive, assessment of the character of a person depends not just on the action itself, but also on the incentive, also the R. So in order to assess whether, intuitively speaking, the, the merchant, the shopkeeper, is a virtuous person, is a good person, we need to look at more than just the outward action, but also the reason why. Let me ask again if there are questions. Okay, so here's another example of basically the same point. Um, where someone might have an immediate inclination to do something. Um, and, sorry, where somebody might have an immediate inclination to do something, which something is also what duty requires of it. And Kant wants us to see that we're going to assess the person differently based on whether they are acting in that way because they happen to have any inclination to act that way, 
or because they recognize that that's what duty requires. Um, so, um, on 13, at the very bottom of the page, so this is uh, 398, it says, to be beneficent where one can is one's duty. Okay, so just asserting that, that helping other people when you can is a duty, um, but whether an act of beneficence uh, is reflects a praiseworthy and unconditionally good will um, depends whether depends on why the person's doing that. Um, so, for example, some people um, might have simply an inclination, an empirical desire to help. They happen to take pleasure in um, doing so. And if that's their motive, if their reason for helping other people is because they just happen to like it, they have an empirical desire for it, then their actions, Kant wants to say, um, are not especially um, reflective of a good person. Now, I want to emphasize here that they're not to be condemned for doing that either. Um, what they're doing is not contrary to duty, but they don't reflect an especially good will so if the act of beneficence is done simply because the person happens to feel like it, those are good consequences, like helping the person, but this doesn't reflect a good character. Um, and so this is just like the shopkeeper. So the shopkeeper who charges a fair price for some other so to speak, contingent reason, <coughs> is in fact doing the right thing, is in fact acting as justice requires, acting as morality requires. But we wouldn't say that this is an unconditionally good person. Um, okay. Um, so, in, in these kinds of, is that clear? Question about that. So in these kinds of cases, um, he's what Kant is trying to do is resist saying that the person who brought about those good consequences, like helping somebody else in need or charging a fair price, those are good consequences. Those are things that somebody acting from duty would have to do. But he doesn't want to say that the person, in these cases, who did those has a good will. Um, so he imagines a case in which there is no inclination, no empirical desire to do those things. Um, there's no alternative motive, except that they recognize it's their duty. And in this case, Kant wants to say, we can be sure that the motive is um, their recognition of duty. Because there's no, uh, there's no other empirical desire that could be uh, uh, motivated. So this is the kind of thing he's saying on 398 um, over on page 14. He says, suppose then, that the mind of the friend of humanity were beclouded by his own grief, which extinguishes all compassion for the fate of others. So no empirical desire, no inclination to help other people. That he still had the means to benefit others in need, but the need of others did not touch him because he is sufficiently occupied with his own. And that now, so he doesn't feel an empirical hope and inclination. And that now, as inclination, no longer stimulates him to it, he were yet to tear himself out of this deadly insensibility and to do the action without any inclination solely from duty. Um, not until then does it have genuine moral worth. Okay, so um, what he wants to say about this is that in that kind of artificial case, 
where there's no empirical desire, no inclination to help others, but he does it anyway. In that case, he says, it's clearer that that person has a good one. That that's a first person. So he's making up these kinds of artificial cases in order to help clarify what it is that leads us to say the person has a good will. Um, so what I want to emphasize here is that it's, in this case, it's not because, sorry, we don't praise this person, because he's acting contrary to inclination. We praise this person because he's acting on the proper motive, a recognition of that. Maybe that's what duty requires, a recognition that other people are in need. Um, so, I say again, our praise of that person is not because he's acting contrary to his inclination, but because in that case we can be confident, confident that he's acting on the right board. Um, so, this leads to the obvious next question, which is what about a case where a person who likes doing something, like helping other people, he enjoys it, takes pleasure in it, but enjoys it, likes doing it, takes pleasure in it, because he recognizes that it's his duty. In that case, Kant would say, the person who acts be because he recognizes that it's his duty, and he likes to do that, maybe he has a desire to do what his duty requires, well, in that case, it, he is acting for duty. In that case, it's his duty that underlies his action. It is, and he is, morally praiseworthy. In fact, Kant thinks that there's a, a distinctive feeling, empirical feeling, that we get when we do one's duty. Um, but acting morally, acting from duty, requires acting because we recognize that's what duty requires, not in the hope of attaining that empirical feeling. So that feeling, that good feeling that we get when we do the right thing, that feeling of moral satisfaction, is a byproduct of doing the right thing, not what we're aiming for in doing the right thing. And we'll see that a little bit more clearly in a minute. Okay, so, um, so notice that, I want to make this point again, notice that both the person who helps others because she happens to like it, has an empirical desire to do so, and the person who helps others because she recognizes that duty requires it, both of them perform the same action for its own sake. Both of them take that action to be worth doing, not in order to bring about some further end, but because they both recognize that action to be good. So the A, the action itself, is the same in both of their maxims. And furthermore, in neither case is that action done instrumentally. Let me say this again. So whether a person acts, we're talking about um, helping others in need. One person helps another person in need. One person sees another person in need um, and uh, happens to feel like helping that person out. Another person, seeing the person in need, recognizes that it's morally required of her to help that person. Both of them help that person in need for its own sake, but for different reasons. Um, so maybe their maxims are something like this. Um, 